it was hot. This was the desert, so it's often hot, but this was the kind of day that you have to plan ahead for. The kind of day where it would be 15 degrees cooler in the shade if there had been any shade, but this desert was mile after mile of stony, rocky ground. And the only plants growing were low, shrubby things that didn't provide any shade at all. It was several days of walking from Judea to Galilee. You could make that journey a little bit shorter if you cut through Samaria, but you had to put up with some hostile stairs and some short answers, even though this was a part of the world known for hospitality. It was now only about noon, but the disciples and Jesus had set off at first light because nobody who had any choice at all would travel during the hottest part of the day. It was a relief to finally make it to the Samaritan city of Sychar and to be able to sit underneath the palm trees by Jacob's well. But a well without a bucket is not much use. The disciples knew that they were going to have to go into the city and get some food. They weren't going to get it for free because they were Jewish. The Samaritans weren't exactly friendly, but if some coins changed hands, they'd be willing to give the disciples some food. So the disciples went into the city and left Jesus sitting by Jacob's well. And almost as soon as the disciples left, a woman came to draw water. Now, like travelers, women usually did the hard work of hauling water first thing in the morning or at sunset when it was cooler. But here was this woman. She had a water jar, and Jesus said, give me a drink. And that is the beginning of the longest conversation in the Bible between Jesus and anyone. It is an unusual conversation, and it gets even odder as it goes along. This conversation lasts for most of the fourth chapter of John, so I didn't have Karen read the whole thing. It's a conversation which should not have happened at all. A woman was not supposed to be alone with any man who was not her father, her brother, or her husband. Women were not supposed to talk to men in public. And Samaritans and Jews were ethnic and theological cousins, a little bit like Irish Catholics and Scotch Presbyterians who didn't like each other very much at all and would do whatever it took to avoid one another. In fact, if a Jew touched a Samaritan vessel that you ate or drank out of, it would become ritually unclean, so they couldn't eat or drink together. So for Jesus to say to this woman, give me a drink of water, that was a pretty complicated social interaction right there. And this woman, instead of keeping her eyes on the ground and silently drawing up a jar of water for Jesus to drink, says, why are you a Jew asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? And from there it gets even weirder if that's possible, because Jesus starts talking about living water, water which will never run dry, water which will become an eternal spring that gushes up. And the woman is curious, but understandably a little bit confused. If this living water actually exists, why doesn't Jesus just give it to her? And if when you drink this living water, you're never thirsty again, why is he asking her for a drink? The turning point of this extended conversation happens after verse 16, 
when Jesus says, go, call your husband and come back. And the woman admits that she has no husband. And Jesus says, yes, that's right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. We don't get any more details about this woman's past. The conversation veers off in a theological direction. But I want to consider this part of the conversation because I think it's important. It's clearly important to this woman because this is the conversation that changes her from a skeptic to a believer. But it's also important because her backstory is important. Here's what we can say with certainty. Any woman who has had five husbands and is living with a man who is not her husband has had a rough life. Any woman coming to a well by herself at noon is probably an outcast in her community. A Samaritan woman who would have a conversation with a Jewish man that she had never met probably has nothing to lose. I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this woman's story and the need she has for acceptance and relationship because I believe that's a need that each one of us has for relationship and acceptance, whether we're honest enough to admit it or not. I found my illustration in an unlikely place, a comic strip called Pearls Before Swine. It's by Stephen Postus. The name, I'm sure, is a reference to Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 6. I don't think this comic strip is meant to be theological commentary, but one of the characters is a pig. I believe there's some insight here. I'll show it to you frame by frame. First is a pig with a sign that says, Love me for who I am. Time goes by, and his sign says, Love me for who I could be. More time passes. He's changed the sign. It says, like me as much as you can. The next sign says, just like me. He's been out there most of the day, and the sign says, tolerate me. Finally, as evening comes on, his sign says, I'll take what I can get. Now, for most of us, putting out a sign asking for what we need or even what we hope for would make us way too vulnerable. That's part of what makes this funny, if you think it's funny, that we would ever need to be this blatant or allow other people to see the compromises that we have to make in order to get what we need. But we internalize these things, but I don't think it makes them less real. The woman at the well, I believe, is here in this final frame. She will take whatever she can get. She would probably be happier if the woman in her community would just like her or even tolerate her, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I doubt if husbands four or five liked her as much as they could. Maybe no one has ever loved her for who she could be. And probably not for who she is. Until this conversation with this 
prophet. Notice that Jesus does not shy away from this woman's backstory. He already knows it, and she's honest enough to own it to him. I don't think this conversation probably would have gone anywhere if the woman had lied to Jesus. Lying to ourselves and lying to Jesus gets us nowhere. In fact, it's a recipe for getting other people to despise us and treat us badly. But Jesus doesn't dwell on this woman's story. He doesn't demand that she go back and fix that string of broken relationships before she comes back and talks to him. Jesus accepts her for who she is right now at the place where she is right now and offers her the possibility of new life, eternal life. Jesus treats her with dignity and respect, and she recognizes him as a great prophet, maybe even the Messiah. This relationship transforms this woman, not only from a skeptic to a believer, but from someone who is physically and emotionally on the margins of her community to someone who is in the center of her community. The disciples come back to the well with lunch and are astonished to see Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman, but they have sense enough not to ask any questions. The woman is so excited to have met Jesus that she leaves her water jug at the well and runs into the city and says, come and see, I have met a man who knows everything that I have ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? And so many of the Samaritans listened to her. Her, that woman that they could barely tolerate, that they invite Jesus to stay for two days. And the afterward, they tell the woman, we came at first because of what you told us, but now we've talked to Jesus and we believe for ourselves that he is the savior of the world. I believe that this woman receives the living water that Jesus offers in verse 10. That living water is the gift of acceptance and relationship. Relationship with Jesus is the only relationship which leads to eternal life. That is why he is the savior of the world. But here's the catch. We can't have that relationship for somebody else. My relationship with Jesus doesn't guarantee your salvation. But if I have received that living water, then I ought to share that living water and that acceptance and relationship which I have found in Christ. In other words, if I have experienced the acceptance of Jesus Christ, who loves me for who I am, then I need to extend that grace to you. Believe me, I know this is easier to say than it is to do. Everybody is annoying sometimes, and some people are annoying most of the time. This is not going to change. But the way we relate to difficult people can change, and how we focus our attention and energy can definitely change. This doesn't apply only to individuals. It applies to groups of people and organizations and even, wait for it, the church. I went to a conference this week with Ron Nicodemus and Jan Weaver, Karen Lewallen, and Mary Ann Zerby. The conference was sponsored by the Center for Congregations, a faith-based organization funded by Eli Lilly. We were energized by this conference and by the possibilities for resources and leadership here at Creekside. You will be hearing more about it. One of the things, some of the resources came from the world of appreciative inquiry.
an organizational and evaluation model that Carrie Kelsey knows very well. As I understand it, appreciative inquiry motivates change by building on the best of what we already have and do together. I believe it directly applies to the living water that we receive and the living water that we offer to one another. It's living water because it happens in the context of relationships. If we don't invest effort in relationships within our church and with people whom we want to come to our church, no amount of consulting or resources or program or church board initiatives is going to do that work for us. Can I hear an amen for that? Thank you. No one can do the work of relationship for us. Sharing living water is our responsibility and our privilege. Here are some building blocks from appreciative inquiry. What we think about determines how we talk. What we talk about determines what we imagine. What we imagine determines what we achieve. Let me say that one more time. What we think about determines what we talk about. What we talk about determines what we imagine. And what we imagine determines what we achieve. I want to give you some concrete suggestions for ways to be living water to someone else this week and in the future. The first suggestion is the easiest, at least for me. And there are some notes about it in your bulletin under the Christian practice of spiritual friendship. It's a gift from the Irish culture. So even if you didn't get to drink green beer or cheer for Notre Dame on St. Patrick's Day, here's a way to honor Celtic spirituality. And Anamkara is a soul friend. This is a little different than a soul mate which is typically a spouse or a life partner. A soul friend is someone who you can be completely honest with, whom you trust completely, and you can share without fear of being belittled or rejected. Someone who loves you as you are. This is the kind of relationship which Jesus created with that woman at the well. I hope you already have someone like this in your life. My Anamkara moved out of Goshen last year. I'm leaving town this afternoon to, to go and visit with her. I know that if I had to, I could pick up the phone and call her and talk to her, and it would be like no time had passed since the last time we visited. There are some questions in the bulletin for you to ask and to listen to with your soul friend. You don't have to follow these questions, of course, but like Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the idea is to move the conversation to something deeper and richer than, how was your week? How are the kids? The second suggestion might be more difficult. You may need to enlist the help of your soul friend or someone else you trust to encourage you and keep you accountable. Remember these frames of the comic strip? It started with love me for who I am. Could be like me as much as you can. Just like me. This is the second to the last frame, tolerate me. Maybe there is a person, it doesn't have to be somebody here at Creekside, but it could be who you just tolerate. Or maybe you don't tolerate them at all. See what you could do to move them up a frame or so in this equation. 
See if you can move your feelings for them to something more positive, like tolerate me or just like me. Here's some suggestions about how to do that. First of all, pray for that person. Maybe your prayers start as just praying that they won't annoy you so much. Remember, you're not praying that they will change. You're praying that your feelings toward them will change. Maybe you can end up praying that God will help change your perception of them. Remember, what we think about or pray about determines what we talk about. So the next step is not to say negative things about that person, either to their face or behind their back. Doesn't mean that you have to do what they tell you to or if you have to like what they say, but maybe you could ask God to begin to help you focus on what gifts and strengths that person has, maybe even what motivates them that's different than what motivates you. And finally, if you've worked on thinking and talking, try treating them the way that you would want them to treat you. Now, I didn't come up with that on my own. Jesus and a whole lot of other folks have suggested that. But treating others the way you want to be treated, pretty great way to share living water with one another. And it can transform relationships. And if you've never tried this, you're lucky if people tolerate you. And you might just have to take what you can get. This unlikely heart-to-heart -heart conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well is a model of the transformation that can happen when we realize that we are accepted and loved by Jesus Christ. It's a source of living water that we can share with each other and with our family of faith and with our neighbors in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.